bees, butterflies and pollinating insects are dying out. This giant insect workforce pollinate our crops and if they disappear, most of our favourite foods will vanish too. It's a complex crisis, but poor nutrition is leaving our insect pollinators vulnerable to pesticides and parasites. I'm Sarah Raven and in this series I'm on a campaign to wake people up and show everyone the simple steps we can take to stop this quiet catastrophe. The thing is, if we all make a conscious decision to plant pollen and nectar-rich plants throughout the country, together we can get Britain buzzing again. Last week I tackled our countryside and showed how we can make our villages and farmland far more friendly for our butterflies, bees and pollinating insects. This week my campaign moves to our towns, our gardens and our flower displays. They may seem much smaller in scale, but combined they make up a massive network of green space, estimated at well over a million acres and the potential to help our pollinators here is huge. We have a choice. Either we continue to watch the decline of our insects or we do something about it. And what I've been learning is it's actually very easy to make a real difference. It's just a case of relearning which are the simple flowers which are useful to our pollinating insects and planting them instead of the fancy blooms which aren't. The big culprits are some of our favourite bedding plants like double begonias, busy lizzies and bedding geraniums, which we plant by the million each year in our gardens, our roundabouts and throughout our flower beds. They're colourful, cheap and easy fillers and may well be our favourites, but I doubt our insect pollinators would agree. Dr. Jeff Ollerton has been researching the relationships between flowers and insects for over 20 years, and he knows that not all flowers are equal. These are all really good examples of plants that I wouldn't put into a garden if I was interested in supporting pollinators and providing food for those pollinators. All of them are so highly bred, there's no nectar, there's no pollen available, or if it is available, it's very, very difficult to access. With something like this plant here, which is a member of the daisy family, something which should have a fairly simple blossom containing lots and lots of individual flowers. And here, all of these individual flowers have turned into showy petals with little or no pollen available. To the gardener, they offer colour and impact, but to the pollinators, they don't offer anything. No food, no nectar, no pollen. But the plants we put in our gardens and flower displays are more important now than ever before, as over recent decades our countryside has changed so massively. We've lost 98% of our wildflower meadows and there's much less food and natural habitat for pollinators and wildlife in general. But our bees and pollinating insects are crucial as they fertilise many of our crops and without them, our favourite foods could disappear from the supermarket shelves. And so that's where our gardens and flower displays could become so vital. If we choose the right flowers, we could give our honeybees, butterflies and all the other pollinating insects the help they so desperately need. So in our towns, we're better to start my campaign than by challenging competitors in the biggest gardening competition in the land to think of our bees and butterflies first and their medals second. One of the most successful Britain in Bloom groups is Harrogate, whose bedding tradition goes back to Victorian times. It's a town that takes its gardening very seriously and has a fierce reputation for excellence. So it could be an uphill struggle to persuade the people who design these displays 
which are so medal successful to change anything in their choice of plants. I'm feeling quite nervous, um, really because Harrogate is such a key centre. If we can get them on side, because they're consistent winners of Britain in Bloom, then I feel lots of other towns will follow. So they could be the flag bearers for the whole campaign. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Sarah Raven, and I've come today to talk to you a little bit about a campaign that I am launching here really we are in a crisis of biodiversity at the moment every county throughout britain are losing particularly moths bees and butterflies and we've all got to do something about it as the custodians of of our environment and all of you as gardeners would be a real help in that to encourage britain in bloom to change i'm going to need two plans of attack Ultimately, I'll need to persuade those in charge of the competition at the Royal Horticultural Society, but first I need to get the support of a Bloom community and get them to change. So I've brought expert Dr Jeff Ollerton to provide some hard facts. As Sarah mentioned, a lot of our insects are declining. So, for example, something like 67% of our moth species have declined over the last 50 years. About 25% of our hoverfly species have declined. We've lost three bumblebee species which have gone extinct and the trends are continuing downwards. The key to my campaign in Harrogate is to get the Bloom group to change the types of plants in their displays. For instance, rather than perhaps begonias, we move to single dahlias. Can you actually maintain the quality by making the changes that you're suggesting? The whole sort of wildlife gardening thing has this reputation for being messy. That really, 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 really doesn't need to be the case. It still looks great. You can still get the same colours that you want. You've just got something that's very nectar-rich and insect-friendly. I'm a little bit concerned about um, how are you going to encourage people to pick the right sort of plants, like at garden centres or any sort of nurseries, because people tend to go to those and just pick what they fancy. Mary Bond had hit on a key issue here. How do gardeners really know what they should be planting? It's something I'll definitely need to look into, and it's clear that Mary and fellow Bloom Group member Caroline Bayliss could become important allies to drive the campaign forward in Harrogate. What we started doing on the website last year was taking a photograph and then doing the actual... Oh, the planting, the planting plan. plan. So, okay. again, listening to what you've been talking about today, I think that would be a good opportunity for us to get it across to the public. Excellent. Because we can put an explanation. <laughs> and if you plant such and such, um, obviously you're going to attract the bees to the garden as well. So that, that, that could be quite a useful... Fantastic. That would be really good. Mary's response is encouraging. But Britain in Bloom is now such an established gardening institution across the whole of the UK, I can tell it's not going to be easy to affect a sea change in attitudes. The competition was set up by the Tourist Board in 1963 to provide an incentive for passionate groups of volunteers to beautify their communities. Floral wow factor and tidiness soon became the obsession as villages, towns and cities across the country joined in. In 2001, the RHS took the reins and ever since has tried hard to shed the old-fashioned blousy blooms image and has done much to bring in greener initiatives such as composting and more naturalistic planting. But to win the competition, bright colours and bedding plants are still hugely important. I want to show everyone that there's a real opportunity here to help our bees and pollinators that's just being missed. The summer bedding goes in, what, like the 1st of May or...? Now we start our summer bedding the 1st of June. 1st of June, um, OK. Being so a bit these further will... north, we, we have to lose a little later. Otherwise, yeah. uh, we get the late frosts and then we can lose it. Patrick Kilburn is head of Harrogate's Park Department and the man who can make this all happen, or not. He's agreed to show me around the town where the planting is treated like a military operation. If you did a sort of questionnaire around Harrogate of what they feel most proud of in their town, do you think one of the things will be the bedding schemes and the general kind of flora? I think it's more than just saying, do I think, we actually know. You know. We, we do get a lot of feedback, very, very positive comments from the public, and that's what we're very proud of. The sense of civic pride in Harrogate is huge, and winning gold in Britain in Bloom is pretty much expected, so any suggestions from me could really take Patrick out of his comfort zone. But Caroline from the Bloom Committee is keen for me to see something more optimistic for Harrogate pollinators. Can we go and change some of our crocus, please? Because this is something we are particularly known for 
a little bit over at the moment. Yeah. Can you walk and get have a look at okay, some of yeah, I love a crocus. Crocus are particularly good flowers for pollinators. They provide nectar and pollen when there's little else around early in the year for our bumblebee queens. This whole area is just a mass of purple and white crocus. It looks quite divine. If I can persuade Harrogate to increase these sorts of simple nectar and pollen-rich flowers in their bloom displays across the year, I'll have really got Harrogate buzzing again. Patrick's agreed to let me change two of the flower beds as a trial. So my next stop is the council nurseries to meet the team that grow the plants for the displays. I need to convince them too, as it'll mean change to the types of plants they propagate in the future. So we're looking mostly at these two beds here. Um, originally it was going to be um, F1 geraniums and marigold edging. I've sort of got my scrapbook here which may help us. Now, these are all single dahlias, so that one's called Juliet, that one's called Bishop of Auckland. Rebecca's, which are fantastic. This is the Cosmos called Antiquity, so we've got the aesthetic and the insect benefit. Yeah. Oh, and then the Cardinal Abelia. Yes. Excellent, it's not too late for all that, is it? No problem at all. <laughs> Looking across this sea of bedding plants, it's clear what I'm suggesting would mean a massive change. Many of the varieties being grown in their millions would need to be replaced, but agreeing to trial a new range of plants as an experiment to fill a couple of prominent beds in the town is a great start. But I'm still thinking about Mary's question. How do we all know which flowers are best for our bees and insect pollinators? It's quite a grey area, so I've come to the Royal Horticultural Society's flagship gardens at Wisley to get some clear tips from RHS advisor Helen Bostock. The great thing here, Helen, is that we've got a really good combination of plants that you see in lots of people's gardens. And I was just wondering if you could give me the guidelines of how I can tell when I walk into a garden centre and there's tons and tons of plants to choose from, how do you know which are the things that are good for pollinators and the ones that are useless? There's some really simple pointers that we can give to gardeners. Great. The first thing is, first of all, look to see if the flower is single or double. Mm. Generally speaking, single flowers where you can see the pollen, the stamens in the centre of the flower, it's nice and open. Yeah. That tends to be better, it's more accessible for the nectar and the pollen for pollinating insects. The second principle is the flower shape. Try to get a range of flower shapes because they will all cater for different insects. Yeah. Out in front we've got these superb Achilles here. This is a very flat, open flower structure. It's also a composite flower. There's an awful lot of flowers making up that one head. Yes, yes, And because yes. it's open, short-tuned insects, things like hoverflies, can easily get on there and very easily get at the pollen and nectar. The last thing is to look at plants which have a succession of flower opening. The foxglove is a classic. We can see down the bottom here that there's some of the old flowers that have faded. Mm -hmm. There's a cluster in the centre of flowers which are open and ready and available. But we can also see if there's flowers still to come. These flowers will go on for weeks. Helen's three simple tips of a succession of flowers, a variety of flower shapes and single blooms are great to consider when putting any planting plan together for pollinators. And these are the exact rules that I want Harrogate to follow, so I've decided to send them to see these principles used to full effect at the horticultural event of the year. It's the Chelsea Flower Show. I want to prove to Patrick, Mary and Caroline that pollinator-friendly planting can be as eye-catching as their colourful bloom displays and can win major medals too. I really hope they'll be inspired by one young garden designer on his first outing to Chelsea with a biodiversity garden. In most people's gardens, when somebody is a plantaholic, they have a huge range of plants. By encouraging such a diversity, then you're going to encourage a lot of insects into the garden. Layering in the garden is really important because different layers are appealing to different kinds of insects. You will get different bees that are coming in at slightly higher heights, some of the hoverflies and the smaller insects like ants that will be lower down. And it's all about kind of creating a tapestry of layers that really weaves through the garden. Everything we've tried to do is to make a garden have a soul, and the soul really is the wildlife. 
tell us a bit about the colours you've got here, Paul? Is it an interesting sort of selection of the purples and yellows? All of the colour choices in the garden came from research that was carried out in India and Sheffield as to what colours of plants, insects that have never been introduced to colour, so particularly excited by this kind of lilac, mauve, yellow. So that was our starting block for building the colours into the garden. You've got a lot of plants here. If you were going to sort of suggest two or three as key plants for us to maybe try or look at? Things like aquilegias, which are fabulous at this time of year because they're kind of singing at insects to come and take the nectar. And bees really love things like allium because all of the petals kind of relax open, giving the insect a really wide access. The other thing I would say is make sure you've got successive planting. So things like this Veronica, mm. which will be flowering much later in the year, can have things like early geraniums growing through. And when the geranium's gone over and ordinarily it would look slightly untidy, the Veronica will be kind of pushing out all the foliage and will cover that. Mm. And then it will come into flower. And again, that's reduced the amount of maintenance. Yeah. Yes, we don't want to start looking just generally untidy. No, that, that is inherited. My only concern with it is how it fits into some of the settings that we've got. I thought the colour scheming was absolutely wonderful. I think that purple and yellow, I think particularly this time of year, it's really, really effective. And just the odd touches of pink in there as well. Really like that. In park bedding, you do tend to have a bit more of the orange and the bright red and the... Whereas those lovely yeah. pastel shades, which obviously Mary and I would we quite, we quite, absolutely we, 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 love. I'll be honest, I'm not, I'm not actually keen on the traditional Victorian bedding. That's See, some of this, <laughs> some of this helps our arguments with Yes, yeah, he, does, he does listen. He does listen. <laughs> Despite the difference in opinion on colour schemes, the fact that so many gardens at Chelsea have picked up on planting with pollinators in mind seems to have had a positive effect. So what are their conclusions to the day? I was a bit of a sceptic at first, and the reason for that is, is that the, the bedding in the, in the parks is fairly traditional. That's what Harrogate is renowned for. And to start to move away from that is a risk. So what I've been sort of reassured by, if you like, is the diversity. The colours are still there. The choice is still there. And I think there's a real opportunity. I really do. This is the way gardens are going. Traditional bedding, people are just not interested in that in the same way. I mean, you wouldn't want to come here. You don't see traditional bedding here. I think one of the most exciting things is, is how far Patrick's already gone yeah. down this path. <laughs> In fact, probably quicker than yes, the rest of us. Yes. I'm amazed at the difference a day at the Chelsea Flower Show can make, but will it last when they all get back to Harrogate? I really hope so. But for me, it's time to make sure that I'm practising what I preach. So back in my garden at Perch Hill, Experienced garden naturalist Steve Head has come to help me assess my own garden for its suitability for insect pollinators and to award it an insect-friendly score. So this is the walled bit of garden. Oh boy, that's lovely. I mean, it's quite jungly in here, which is probably a good thing, isn't it? Oh, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, what's the point of having bare earth in a garden, I ask myself? It's not what it's there for. No, this, this actually already touches an awful lot of good points. You've got so much different structure in here. Uh, you've got the density of the bamboo, mm -hmm. you've got the, the, the tall grasses, you've got the perennials, but there's just generally a pretty good big biomass of plants in here. There are possibly one or two things we could comment on, though. Um, <laughs> it's a downside. Well, not a really a downside, but you have to think hard about succession in the, in the garden because it's very important that you try to get a nectar and pollen flow all through the year. Yeah. And actually, quite a lot of your pollen and nectar-producing plants are beginning to go over now. But let's be clear, all you're trying to do is to make your garden attractive for wildlife. It doesn't mean that everything you put in it has yeah. got to be absolutely perfect. As far as I'm concerned, it's got to look like a garden and be a pleasure to look at, and then just tweak it to make sure it's good for wildlife as well. Yeah, so marks out of ten, how am I doing, do you think? Well, I think you're probably well up above five or six. Oh, but, well, God! No, That's it's a, a lovely garden, <laughs> but it really tends to be doing one thing. Now, okay. something I'll tell you that would give you an immediate plus two marks would be to put in some water. Oh. Yeah. Did you know that bees use several litres of water a day on a hot day like this to keep Gosh. their hive cool? Okay. And it takes 40,000 trips by a bee to get a litre of water. <gasps> so if you put a, a, an area up that the bees can take water from, in other words, very, very shallow at the edges, yep. then you'll be doing the pollinators an enormous surface. My garden's got the potential to be great for wildlife, and by adding water and more late flowering plants like sedums, buddleias and Michaelmas daisies, 
I'll be able to get a much better succession of nectar and score top points from Steve. Back in Harrogate, I've asked expert pollination ecologist Dr Jeff Ollerton to join Mary Bond from Harrogate in Bloom to see how easy it is to find insect-friendly plants at her local garden centre. Yeah, so you've got quite a nice selection of all the different plants for containers and yeah. stuff here. So it's a case of, you know, how would you know where to start? Yeah, that's right. We can obviously start with plant labels. Well, but does, it tell, does it tell you anything at all? about? Uh, attractive green grey foliage, uh -huh. planted containers and garden borders. Yeah. But, but other than other that, than nothing that, at I don't all know. about Let how good sure they are for, the for pollinating insects. That's right. Yeah. And on a day like this, you can't use the insects to guide no, you. No, no, If it was a nice not. sunny day, you could watch the insects visiting the flowers, and that would at least give you an indication of what the insects were fond of visiting and, and, and what they were ignoring. On a rainy day, and with no clear information about bees or butterflies on the labels, it's near impossible to pick plants that are perfect for our pollinators. But Jeff has a trick up his sleeve and has bought a simple scientific device to measure the nectar. Something called a sugar refractometer. So nectar is a sugar solution? Nectar is mainly a yes. sugar solution. It's, yes. there's a, there are a lot of other chemicals in there, but, mm -hmm. but it's predominantly a sugar solution. So this is the kit. So this is actually going to measure the, the, the sugar content. And the volume of sugar being produced in in the flowers. Right. Yes. It's the flowers which are the attraction, mm -hmm. it's the nectar which is the main reward right. and which keeps them coming back to the same type of flower right. and it's the pollen which is being picked up right. by the pollinators and then being spread between the different yes. flowers right. and that's yeah. sexual reproduction in, right. in flowers. So why do they like the nectar? Is it just because it tastes nice or because it's energy for them or because it's obviously it's a, carbo it's a carbohydrate yeah. isn't yes. it? Yeah, yeah it's a, so a source of energy and for things like like many butterflies and, and bees it's, it's almost their sole source of, of carbohydrate. Right. So for our insects visiting a flower that has no nectar award is a bit like turning up at a restaurant that's run out of food. We use these glass micro capillary mm -hmm. tubes to measure the volume of nectar so how do you know where to put your capillary in there? Essentially you've got to behave like a bee and you can see where the, the open florets are. Oh I see, like little tubes, aren't they? Yeah. And that explains why the bee sits there a while and it just yeah. uh, dots away Goes the around. Yeah. So now we'll pop that onto one of these sugar refractometers. Oh, you need a tiny spot, isn't it? Yeah. It is, yes. Okay, so that's about 35% sugar concentration. Gosh, that's a lot. It's an awful yeah. lot of energy for the plant to be investing in providing that reward yes, for its yes, pollinators. Yeah. But for, as far as the plant's concerned, there's a lot riding on it. So it's really important. a dahlia is obviously a really good choice for a garden, but that's presumably the single dahlia. Yes, that's so a single dahlia. We've got this one that's the, what I would call the more ornamental one. Yep. And probably what most people would regard as a dahlia. Typical dahlia, very so double the, flowers and yeah. very, very highly bred. So you're trying to find these same little tubes in there, but I can see where you have the problem now because they're yep. all, yeah, they're just not visible, are they? No, I can't get any nectar out of there at all. Okay. So it's a real contrast. In, yes, in, that's right. Those, yeah, so by choice. Two. I mean, and to be honest, that's as bold and as colourful as this double many petal one. Yes. yes, exactly. So yes. That, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the way honest, nature has yeah. evolved it. Yeah. Whereas yeah. that's the way yeah. people have yeah. bred it. Yeah. And what about things like the begonia? Well, the begonia, something like that, will be producing no nectar right. at all. Once they've been as, as highly bred as that, there's nothing there at all. Would you like to do it yourself in yeah. your own garden? Yeah, that'd be great. Excellent, thank you. Okay. As Mary begins her own experiments in her garden, I'm about to meet someone who's been studying and assessing her own back garden in scientific detail for over 40 years. Hello there. Hello. Sorry about the welcome room project. No, no, Jennifer Owen is an entomologist who lives in Leicester. I've come to find out more about her pretty but very average back garden that proved just how valuable all our gardens could be for wildlife. When we first moved into this house and started looking at the garden in, in 1972, we re realised the garden had a lot of possibilities. I ran a trap, which is called a malaise trap, with a pitched roof right. made of netting, which captures flying insects. Right. 
but I also hand nest butterflies, sank pitfall traps all around the garden to catch beetles and centipedes, a whole range of different things. And what did you find? Some small wasps, which were actually new to the British Isles, and one or two which were actually new species to science. Really? I mean, I've identified more than 400 species of, of beetle in this garden. 400 oh. here? But that means they're, they're all busy doing different things. That's absolutely extraordinary. In over 40 years, Jennifer identified and recorded more than 8,000 different types of insect in her garden. Amazingly, that's about a third of the range of insect species we have in the UK. It proved, once and for all, that our gardens planted in the right way could become mini nature reserves. No one had done this sort of continuous operation for so long, and particularly not in a suburban garden. So it was the continuity of the record that was particularly interesting because it was possible to see how butterflies and hoverflies and ladybirds and so on, gradually, uh, over the years, the numbers have gone down and down. By the early 90s, Jennifer's study clearly highlighted the declines in our insects, and this came to the attention of the then presenter of Gardener's World, Jeff Hamilton. With a central baffle. This is the exciting bit, isn't it? Oh! Uh, like insect soup. How on earth now, do you identify this lot? It's largely a question of experience. In the extent Clearly, Jennifer had a profound influence on how he gardened, which Sometimes, in turn affected yes, millions of viewers, who then began to alter their attitude to plants and wildlife in their gardens. But what I wanted to know after all this time is what are Jennifer's simple rules on how to plant a garden for wildlife? The thing is to be sympathetic and relaxed about wildlife, not thinking, oh, it's got too many legs, I'll kill it. I mean, it doesn't yes. do. No. Having met Jennifer, it's completely reinforced the message to me, which is that as gardeners, we can make a massive difference. We really can and we can't ignore that fact. And actually, if we all do a little, we can have a big impact. It wouldn't be difficult for all of us to be a little bit more relaxed about gardening and choose less fussy flowers, and that would be brilliant for insects. But on a very wet and windy morning in Harrogate, Mary and Caroline have volunteered to help plant out the summer bedding displays, including my two trial beds of nectar and pollen-rich plants in the most high-profile area of the town, West Park Stray. There we are. Thank you. You want to start at the pointy end? I'm going to start at the pointy end. Caroline and Mary loved the subtle colours at Chelsea, but it was too late to change the colour scheme for this first trial year. So it's Patrick's traditional yellow and red for now. Fairly nervous, <laughs> in case we get ticked off for not having done it quite right. These guys are professional, and when I'll start dying off before everybody else's, that will be the grim moment. Double begonias and pelagoniums have been swapped for insect-friendly, single red dahlias, rebeccias and angelicas. It's not quite as radical a change as I'd hoped, but if it impresses the judges, there may be more widespread changes will come. Will we pass, or, or do you like to disemploy us immediately? Just another, just another two, so I've got another two. Oh, another two, please. Thank you very much. Oh, one there and one there. I can see the gaps, yeah. yeah. Fired up by all the research I've gathered, I've decided to tackle the gardening industry next. I want to put to them the question that Mary and Harrogate first posed about how to choose the right plants for pollinators. I'm at the National Plant Show. It's a trade event that brings together nurseries, garden centres, growers and suppliers from right across the country. It's a perfect opportunity to try and get the industry on board with my campaign. Hello everybody, good afternoon on this lovely day. I've brought together an expert team, Dr Jeff Ollerton, Helen Bostock from the RHS and Doug Stewart, a freelance marketing specialist in horticulture, to help me convince players in the industry that what we need to make it easier for gardeners is a simple labelling system. There's increasing acknowledgement of the role both gardens and garden plants have to play in supporting these pollinating insects. But as you might imagine, 
With over 70,000 plants in the RHS plant finder, gardeners need all the help they can get in choosing the right plants. When it was suggested that we did something as simple as put a logo that says you need to plant these if you want to help pollinating insects, it was one of those eureka moments, why haven't we done it? I think it's one of the most exciting innovations for our industry in the last few years. Thank you very much. It was very good, it was very good. And uh, as we keep finding, we push on a door and it opens wide. It's just like people are waiting to be galvanized and to give them some kind of structure of how to act, which is truly fantastic. It's clear that the industry is open to the idea of a pollinator-friendly label, and it looks like Harrogate's Britain in Bloom group are open to some changes too. So it really feels like I'm getting somewhere now. In fact, there's no stopping Mary. She's one of my main campaign supporters in Harrogate and is taking science into her garden by doing her own nectar testing to see what her garden flowers have on offer. When I first started, you have these little glass capillaries and you're poking them into the flower. Um, you don't know if you're not doing it right or it hasn't got any nectar or what I've really deduced after the first sort of 24 hours when I wasn't getting anything out is actually the bees have got in there first and they've sucked the flowers dry. So I found this in my cupboard upstairs which I don't think might have potpourri in it at some sort of stage this organza drawstring bag so I put that round there for 48 hours um, and that really isolates it lets the air circulate I can keep the bees off and it gives me a really good chance to actually test the nectar with the bees no longer affecting her results Mary's been pushing the glass capillary tubes into all sorts of different flowers in her garden and taking readings we have an annual musk mallow that pops up every so often that really really smells of honey and that was 71 percent and then you've got these other ones in the sort of the 50s the pink hebe round the corner 66 so there's real variation and just out of curiosity what i was trying to do is work out what these numbers actually mean so i was testing things around about the house and i've a cup of tea with some milk and two sugars in is seven percent the sort of the juice you get on top of your jar of raspberry jam if you haven't stirred it in, that's coming at 63%. So if you imagine this nectar here in things like the Hebe is sweeter than a jar of raspberry jam, I think that sort of gives some indication of the, 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 the scale. The insects are a fantastic thing to study. If you like wildlife in your garden, you can get actually very close. Just a sort of simple little digital camera, it's very easy then just to go in and get some really nice shots. It's been fascinating, it's a bit like being Kate Humble in your own garden, doing your own version of Spring Walk. Mary's homegrown experiment is giving her just the sort of encouragement I hoped it would. In my own garden, I've already found out about two separate measures to improve its attractiveness to insects and increase my pollinator friendly score. But I also want to discover more about what's already here. So Steve is going to teach me some simple sampling techniques. Right, Sarah, we're going to continue the really high-tech sampling techniques <laughs> by using things which are known as yellow tray traps. <laughs> really, really simple. I'm not sure I uh, like those in my garden. Well, don't you think? I mean, that you like sunflowers. <laughs> what's the difference between this and a sunflower? What you've got here is a piece of cane. Mm -hmm. You've got one of those clever little jobbies you stick on the end of canes to mm. stop yourself poking your eye out. And then glued onto that is an extremely sophisticated 149 for 10 kids party plate. Really and then push it into the ground <laughs> like that and top it up with a bit of water with okay. just a tiny bit of detergent in there. And that kills the surface tension. So if any insect hits that, it goes plop and it'll stay there in the water. They're very good for catching things like flies yeah. and particularly hoverflies. And you know, hoverflies are really important pollinators. Yes, yes, But actually, have so. you ever tried to catch one with a net? They're really speedy. Well, I've been seeing a few very yeah. small hoverflies in here, and yeah. so I hope, yeah, they will. So anyway, it, it catches things which other techniques don't necessarily. And I think they look very aesthetic in the garden. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens later. Now, this is nice, Sarah. What, because of the long grass? Yes, and this is a job for you. Now, what do you think this is? Well, <laughs> I think you've been stealing from my washing line, but that is definitely a pillowcase. It, it is, absolutely, it's a pillowcase. Mm -hmm. And I've taken two coat hangers and then pulling them out so that they make a square and then taping them together so they're good and strong and then simply binding them onto this old broom handle using a couple of Jubilee clips. And then, finally, 
you put on a pillowcase, I've just glued it in position, but you could obviously, you could sew it, it'd probably be better if you sewed it. And there you've got a fully functional sweep net. This is quite strong. It's yeah. tougher than an ordinary butterfly net. Yeah. And the one I want you to do is to walk through the grass and swish it backwards and forwards. Be quite swift, and at each end okay. you turn it over like that. Then we'll see what we've got in the long grass. <laughs> Is that right? Yep, that's great. Plenty of energy, that's it. It's good fun, this. I could get quite <laughs> into it. Enough? OK, let's see what we've got. We can always carry on. Oh, careful. Oh, that's it. You, you can sort of fold it over like that, and then it seals the net. Okay. But um, we'll see what we've got. That, that's, that's a little beetle. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And there's Trying a moth. to fly. There's a Looks moth. Looks like a glorified large clothes moth. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, I think it might be a thing called a snout moth, moth actually. Um, you find in grass. There it is. There's the moth. Oh, and another. And there, there's one flying off from me. Of course, lots of grass seed and things will hide in there. There's a, a little ground beetle there, yes. do you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gosh, there's Trying lots. To fly. There's a lot in there. And it's a really simple, easy technique. Most of us have got small areas around compost heaps or at the base of trees where we could have an area of long grass. Who'd have thought such a basic habitat could be so insect-rich? So, here we are. Yes, with our... Our strange yellow, yellow trays. <laughs> well, they've all caught stuff, haven't they? They have. And I'm afraid, of course, the downside is that they, get, they drown. Yeah. So I wouldn't want people who are just interested in seeing what they've got in the garden to use this mm. technique very often. So that is definitely a hoverfly, isn't it? Yes, it is. Very handsome. It looks, yeah, it looks like a little wasp almost, but you can see it's only got two wings. It's a proper fly. I mean, I'm really pleased to see that because one of the things that I w I'm really aware of is that hoverflies are very invisible. You don't really notice them, mm. unlike bees and wasps. But they are fantastic pollinators, aren't the, they? You know, with the decline of bees in some parts of the world, things like this are probably becoming more important. And how do we attract them in? I, they like yellow, don't they? Well, quite clearly, they like yeah. yellow, yes. But they, they, they feed from the same sort of plants as, as bees do. But they seem to be particularly uh, besotted by the yellow ones. The humble hoverfly is such an important pollinator and even though it looks wasp-like, it's completely harmless. Like all our pollinators, they need our help. We've got hundreds of species of these jewel-like insects in the UK, so if you want lots of them in your garden, plant lots of single flowers with bright yellow centres, as these are the ones they particularly love. After months of planning and planting, Harrogate has been crimped and preened, ready for the judges. After visiting Chelsea and listening to my advice, some of the planting has at least been made more insect friendly in a couple of the flower beds. It's not exactly revolution here, but I'm hoping it's a step in the right direction. Right, start at West Park Beds, the biodiversity beds. It's an experiment, and I'm sensing everyone is a bit nervous about what they've signed up for. Harrogate is, after all, trying to maintain its gold medal winning status in the Champion of Champions category of Britain in Bloom. This already yeah. can be altered to try to encourage uh, nectar rich plants, which right. encourage the hoverflies, bumblebees, yeah, yeah. and all sorts of yeah. other insects. Well, we signed up to here, and agree. It is, it's working. It is. Yeah. To the untrained eye, the insect-friendly planting doesn't look that different, but take a closer look at the single dahlias, Rebecca's and Angelica. They are literally teeming with pollinators. It's fascinating because what's very noticeable here is, is the insect life that we've got, and when you walk further down, you'll see the lack of it. Two of my staff walked into the office the other day and said, literally, it's amazing, we've just walked all the way up through West Park and said there's nothing until you get to these beds and then they're just covered. And that was on a very dull day. When you yeah. look across it, look, you can just yes, see, you can see the, the differences whole, the making. Yeah? Yeah, wonderful. For people who'd been a little wary, it was very cheering to hear their comments. Patrick seems almost evangelical about the benefits of the two pollinator-friendly flower beds. I wonder if he thinks this is his trump card to win a gold. My two original supporters, however, seem a bit less sure. I think Mary feels it's definitely done its job as far as the, all the hoverflies and the, and the bees and everything else. 
She's a bit worried about whether it has the impact color-wise because it's a little bit more subdued. It's, it's hard, far it's more not of today. Very subdued. No, it's not very subdued for Harrogate. Right, that's subdued. subdued. Okay. Yeah, I like yeah. this. I mean, I know the yeah. Sarah, Sarah's not going to like the double yeah. bigger, but they, they, they do give a wonderful yeah. impact, yeah. don't they, in, term, in, in terms yeah. of colour. If we'd have gone for the biodiversity bed right the way down, it would have been green really through to the end of last month. I really thought I'd won Mary over, but I think she's worried that for the judges it's all about colour and impact. But I still think I can make the case for both with the pollinator-friendly planting schemes. We are trying to win this thing, if at all possible. We'd like to get your message over, but we'd like gold as well. If the judging criteria was tweaked and bloom groups are really encouraged to try a different range of pollinator-friendly plants rather than the traditional bedding types, Britain in Bloom could be the perfect launch pad to change the way the nation plants, so I need to tackle the RHS Bloom judges. It just but seems to me that there isn't a real incentive for the bedding schemes particularly to move away from the more traditional doubles which have zero insect interest. And the RHS and the Britain and Bloom are the most perfectly positioned body to have that impact because you influence every bedding scheme throughout these islands. A lot of authorities are beginning to introduce more sustainable planting. Yes. A lot of that sustainable planting is very bee, bee and wildlife yes. friendly. Yeah. Absolutely. And no, so, no, so I, there is some move. The other course. thing you must take into consideration is that a lot of the public likes seeing the wow factor <laughs> that you really get from some of the current bedding plants. They, I they agree, really but that. I would still suggest that a well-designed <laughs> yeah. singles bed is yeah. going to have just the same wow factor. Yeah. I just, I, I really, really passionately feel that. I think if it's well designed and well thought out, and to start the ball rolling down the hill, the RHS Britain in Bloom campaign is the perfect place to start. Well, I think there's a possibility of, of something in that direction happening. There was no doubt about it. The amount, I couldn't believe the hoverfly uh, yes. you know, and the bees that were there. And you hadn't planted them there for us, no, did you? No, I didn't come in <laughs> with a, a net. To with release. a bee eye around the corner. <laughs> but it, it was striking, it was imposing. Yeah. You know, so, you know, there are different angles to look at it, but I'm sure it will take off tomorrow because other yeah. people are thinking, well, if that's going to win them something, we must have a crack at that as well. From those reactions, at least one of the judges has been persuaded. But Harrogate will have to wait a few months for the award ceremony in September to see if their strategy of sticking mainly with their Victorian bedding tradition was the right decision. Back at Perch Hill, I'm continuing my own insect audit. Steve set up a moth trap and left it overnight, and now it's time to discover what it's caught. Let's see what we've got. You know, this is one of the most exciting bits about being a garden naturalist, because you walk up to this weird little TARDIS box and you think, is there going to be anything in it? You don't know what's you there. You just don't know what's going to be there. But you often see things around the outside. Ah! Well, that looks like a stick. And that's what it's trying to do. That's a buff tip moth. That's no, a really that's lovely not. Is that thing. really a moth? Yeah, it's a moth, absolutely. Oh my God, that's the most extraordinary. Most fantastic camouflage you could ask for, really, isn't it? I think we might have something nice here as well. See, this just unclips. And we've got some good stuff in here. We've got a large oh elephant hawk moth. Oh my God, moth. that's beautiful. Fantastic. Wow, that's just incredible. In a way, a butterfly eat your heart out. Yes, I mean, it's yes. so subtle yet so It's surprising you'd think things that fly at night wouldn't be colourful like mm. this, but, but many of them are. And we've got a poplar hawk moth. Oh my God, look at these beautiful things. They're absolutely wonderful. So We're that's that another hawk pack. moth? That's another hawk oh, moth, I'm yes. going to become a hawk moth obsessive. A hawk mothologist, yes. Have I got 10 out of 10 now? Oh, we are, nobody ever gets <laughs> 10 out of 10. You've got nine and a half. <laughs> The thing that the moth trap has made me realise is just as Jennifer Owen's study proved, the potential to attract and support a great variety of pollinating insects in our gardens is huge. In Birmingham, it's the Britain in Bloom Awards ceremony, and Harrogate are about to discover what medal they've won this year. Let's not keep the suspense any longer than necessary.
It's the moment of truth for Harrogate. Have they got that all-important gold? And now to Yorkshire, where Harrogate have achieved a Silver Gills Award. Come on, Patrick, we've got to be honest. Yeah. We, don't, we don't go into these without wanting to yeah. win a gold. So s silver gilt is second best, isn't it? To not get what we'd aim for, which was the gold, yeah. it's really, really you know, heart-wrenching. Really. Yeah. It's a corny phrase, I'd be gutted. That's the phrase I'd use. Yeah. Really, I'm disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. Disappointment for Harrogate with only a silver gilt. So what's gone wrong for them this year? The champion of champions is about the very, very best. And when you're comparing the best with the best, you actually nitpick. It's a really, really tough campaign in that sense. And although the betting was very colourful, there was a blandness about it. So it would seem that Harrogate's traditional bedding just isn't enough to achieve gold anymore. But did the pollinator-friendly flowerbirds have any impact on the judges? There was no doubt about it. When you filmed us and we stood there by all these hoverflies and bees, it was very, very impressive. And I think that that's going to agree a great message to a lot of people. I think they need to be a little bit more adventurous in what they do and they don't want to keep putting the same thing in the, in the beds all the way round. So the judges' comments suggest that what's needed in Harrogate is some innovation. And actually, my insect-friendly flower beds seem to have gone down very well. I just hope that the loss of their gold medal status doesn't mean that Harrogate lose heart and that they have the courage to change and plant more nectar and pollen rich flower displays next year. It's May and year two of my campaign and at home I'm turning my most sheltered south-facing garden at Perch Hill into a nectar-rich oasis devoted to insect pollinators. There's already a great backbone of plants in the garden, but I want to enhance it by adding flowers that bees and butterflies go crazy for. So today I'm planting Circium thistles, Echinaceas, single dahlias and blue scabious, and throughout the year I'll be putting in even more to ensure a rich and varied flow of pollen and nectar right into late autumn. I've been in discussion with the Royal Horticultural Society over the last year and trying to persuade them to really look at pollinator friendly plants and to label them. And I've just heard that they are going to do it and they're going to launch it at the Chelsea Flower Show and I'm going to go and help them launch it. So it's really absolutely brilliant. I mean, you couldn't have a better place to get, you know, everybody, the press and the public and everyone really interested. So it's a very, very, very exciting result. A few weeks later, I'm at the Chelsea Flower Show and it's the launch of our brand new Perfect for Pollinators logo and label, a joint initiative supported by both the Horticultural Trades Association and the RHS. Good morning everybody, I'm Roger Williams, the Head of Science at the RHS and thanks for turning out this morning for this launch of the RHS Perfect for Pollinators logo. The new logo will be used in nurseries and garden centres throughout the UK to draw attention to the best plants for pollinating insects. And if you can scan the specially developed labels with a smartphone, you're linked via the internet to a season-by-season -season list of insect-friendly plants. If we could, in every single garden centre throughout the country, have plants labelled really clearly as to which are useful for insects, then it could really help our insect populations, and particularly the pollinator insects. Getting the RHS involved was something that I really wanted from the start. They've backed it in such a definite way, and the Horticultural Trades Association, and I feel really proud, actually. And it's very nice, look, uh, uh, releasing these butterflies at Chelsea. I've also been invited with Helen Bostock from the RHS to chat to Alan Titchmarsh about the label and logo on the TV coverage of Chelsea. If we look for this label, and I shall wear it now, and go around my garden centre looking for things with this on, just to remember that there's something in there, not only to feed our souls and our eyes, 
to defeat the insects as well. You're confident, Sarah, that we can make a difference? We really, as gardeners, can make a massive difference and can get Britain buzzing again. That was a really important moment, actually. I mean, if I'm trying to get the message out to lots of people, there is no better place to do it than at Chelsea with Alan Titchmarsh, who is broadcasting to maybe four million gardeners. And the you know, combination of that and launching the label this morning, fantastic. A few months after the excitement of Chelsea, I'm back in Harrogate. The disappointment of last year's medal result could have meant the end to my campaign there, but it's immediately clear that they've not allowed the judges' comments to dampen their spirit. What we've done is embrace the, the sort of, if you like, the, the philosophy of what you've been trying to, to work with us on, on uh, trying to provide a more diverse environment within that town centre. You know, that's what we've done. We've, we've taken it forward from there. I'm not bothered whether the RHS like what we're doing. I'm not bothered whether the judges like what we're yeah. doing. Yeah. I'm more bothered yeah. whether the community like it yeah. and whether we make yeah. that difference. Yeah. It's the residents, it's the visitors, it it's Harrogate that we're, it we're pleasing, not you know, yeah. people and elsewhere. And as you know, I was a bit sceptical when we started. Um, put my hand up to that, but we, we embraced it, we gave it a shot. And um, I think, I think the, the proof in, is in the pudding, if you like. We've, we've shown that we can do good bedding displays, we can show we can introduce good biodiverse area without losing the quality and the colour. And I'd invite any of the local authorities to come along and uh, see what we're doing, come and talk to us. But we're going to carry on. There's no two ways about it. That is so great. Patrick's new approach is to blend nectar-rich plants through the bedding displays on roundabouts and prominent areas throughout the town. Around 30% of the beds feature nectar and pollen-rich plants, and clearly the change is being appreciated by all sorts of pollinating insects. But even bigger changes to Harrogate's traditional planting schemes are being introduced in the famous Valley Gardens, starting with a project that Mary has set up to get more nectar-rich flowers in gardens across the town. This was a little project that um, I sort of dreamt up over the winter. Um, really just to encourage people in Harrogate to put um, nectar-rich plants in their own back garden. So the idea was I sent away for a kilogram of this meadow mix seed and decanted it all into these little individual bags, nearly 2,000 of them. Oh my God, packaged, that's incredible. Packaged them all up and we gave them out to local gardeners um, who then distributed them to their friends. And Patrick had kindly agreed to put a, you know, a, a sample of what they are here in the gardens. I thought it would be quite nice to do a demonstration bed so people coming through could also see it. And yeah. then if we continue in yeah. future years, people yeah. will be going, we want some more of those, we want some of that. And so uh, an equivalent of this is in loads and loads of back gardens That's throughout right, the town. Yes. I'm really bowled over by the sheer amount of nectar and pollen-rich planting. Many areas now feature displays of pollinator-friendly herbaceous perennials, a clear change to what's gone before. Even the ultra-traditional dahlia border is proudly supporting my campaign with the introduction of some single nectar-rich varieties. And if Caroline Bayliss has her way, it could mean a pollinator-friendly future for all of Harrogate's planting schemes. 18 months isn't very long to yeah, change what has probably been going on here for the last 50 years and I think what we're doing is really, really exciting and very luckily because I happen to become the cabinet member for parks during the year. That, that is just so brilliant. I'll be able to see that through. It's sort of like we've got somebody on, in the campaign right in the centre. Like to think, thing. yes. This is an incredible result as Caroline's new role as cabinet member for parks on the town council means that she can really influence the planting across the town. But the flower bed that could become a template for the future is one that Chelsea Flower Show designer Paul Harvey Brooks has designed for Harrogate. As beautiful as the bedding here might be, yep. it's not doing a lot for wildlife. Whereas our new beds, um, helped by a Chelsea designer, are alive, as you can see, and I think far more beautiful. I think it could be something to do with the colours. I don't know that I'm yes. a great bright softer orange, colours. but much softer. But there is no arguing um, that there is very little insect activity on that, whereas, I, you know, even from here I can see butterflies and bees absolutely yeah. teeming. And because it's an interpretation board which will explain to the public 
why we're doing this. Right. And hopefully they'll take those ideas home and put them in their own gardens. Looks pretty beautiful. Harrogate's new planting really deserves a pollinator-friendly gold medal. But for my campaign to be truly effective, I need bloom groups right across the country to take on board the same changes to their bedding schemes. And the RHS to really push the pollinator-friendly planting agenda right to the fore of the competition. So I've invited Sue Biggs, the Director General of the RHS, to Perch Hill to ask for her support. Do you think there's a chance that pollinator plants might be higher up the RHS agenda, the Britain in Bloom agenda, really, next year? We're absolutely completely behind everything that you're doing. It's really fantastic. As far as the judging next year is concerned, that's under review at the moment. This year's competition hasn't even finished yet, but it's already under review. And absolutely, now we've got this logo, now we're pushing this out, not only through all of the plant centres across the country, but also on our website. Everybody can have a look there at all the pollinator-friendly plants. And we would ask, as you would ask, that not only does everyone in the country plant more of these, but yes, we will be looking at the judging criteria next year for Britain in Bloom. I feel that... You know, you could be doing even more in that department at getting that message out. Yeah, and we will, and we'd love to invite you to come to National Gardening Week next year because there we will be announcing lots of exciting changes that really will make sure that everybody, yes, in bloom, but everybody throughout the country really does do more. Oh, really? So there's something that you've got up your sleeve for Yes, us. but I can't tell you till next April when it's National Gardening Week, and we'll tell you then. It's exciting talk from the RHS Director General and with Sue's support I'm confident that next year Britain in Bloom will be putting the needs of our pollinating insects right at the top of their agenda. The lessons I've learnt from experts along the way have also become a top priority in my very own pollinator oasis. The Nectar Garden has been such a great addition to Perch Hill. It's become a haven for us, but also a haven for the pollinators. And as I'm sitting here, it, there's just incredible, lovely, buzzing tones. And whenever you look around, every flower seems to be full with a honeybee or a hoverfly or a bumblebee. And it's coming to a real crescendo now with July and August in mind. Sitting amongst all these pollinating insects, it'd be easy to assume that there isn't a problem. But both nationally and globally, as their natural habitats decrease, every garden and flower bed really counts. I feel so incredibly encouraged and proud of what Harrogate have done. And it was just wonderful to see that a third of their bedding schemes now have nectar and pollen-rich plants within them. What I'm very excited by is that the RHS have absolutely got behind the idea of trying to get the word out through the horticultural trade to gardeners when you go into a garden centre as to what to buy that is good for nectar and pollen and what is not so good. I also feel really encouraged by meeting the Director General of the RHS. The Britain in Blue marking scheme needs to be looked at. It's good already, it's green already, but it could have even better benefits for pollinators and I feel she's really got it and that is an absolute triumph. Next week in the final programme of this series I'll be taking my campaign into our cities to prove that nectar rich planting is good for pollinators and people alike and convincing those in charge of cities to play their part too. Gentle Comedy with Roger and Val have just got in tonight at 10 on BBC HD. Before that, we're off to Versailles for the final chapter in an indulgent history. And it can only end in tears.